to get started. I know we're a little bit late uh, here, but as you know, we're going to stay at all for it. Okay. So, um, Welcome to the November DT New Tech. As you all know, the DT New, uh, DT New Tech we meet the first Wednesday every month. Um, Wednesday, thank you to our sponsor, Grand Circus. They've been very gracious for uh, hosting this. We usually are over in the other uh, room, but uh, they gave us this because they had uh, an event earlier before when we came in. But uh, I don't know if she's around, uh, if anyone want to talk or say anything about Grand Circus. I know that we got about a few uh, couple of staff here. Maurice? So, uh, welcome everybody. This is Grand Circus. A uh, few things about Grand Circus. Second floor, we have a co-working space. So, we have a number of startups, a number of small, small businesses operating out of that. Uh, and then, the second thing, our main focus is on coding boot camps. So, we have a variety of 10 week, two weeks of pre-work, eight weeks in person. Uh, coding boot camps, we've got a number of students here. Raise your hand if you are a coding boot camp student right now. Half the attendees. We've got a .NET student. We've got several Java students. Our other main boot camp right now, beyond those two, is front end JavaScript. Um, and then our third thing is we have evening training opportunities. We do have a variety of uh, workshops from one Saturday or one evening to you know to multiple weeks. Uh, so if you're interested in getting your feet wet, trying this out, we have Intro to Web Dev Parts One and Two. Uh, we have a Unity 3D game engine uh, workshop coming up end of November. In December, I'll be teaching. Often we have SQL, other workshops. So if you want to expand your skills, we have those opportunities. And we're always ha happy to host uh, meetups so you'll find a number of different activities in the space. Appreciate it, man. How many of you are actually in the Green Circus program? I know I've met you. That's pretty awesome. I mean, they have a great lineup. And I know Maurice, I've worked with and my startup too, so I'm uh, just a great instructor. Uh, in regards to uh, our sponsorship, I'm mean, a really good sponsor, Invest Detroit uh, is one of our sponsors. Tech 248 out of Oakland County, and then we have uh, Open U uh, Inc. Uh, is another incubator that's part of the Smart Zone in Michigan. And then, of course, Grand Circus. Uh, one of the things we try to do is that we try to bring the community together, not only from the Detroit area, but also from Oakland County, also from Wayne County as well as Washington County to kind of help support the startup uh, uh, vibe that's going on. That's actually, uh, that has a lot of energy right now in the uh, southeast area of Michigan. In regards to what we typically do, we have five presenters. We're going to just get started with them, but we actually do not have four presenters, and I think we're down to one. <laughs> a couple of them, uh, we're not sure where they went. Uh, Cards should be, uh, shouldn't have any issue because they are, they are a uh, transportation company for startup. <laughs> but uh, Francois, he's uh, a friend of mine, he does crowdfunding in regards to uh, franchising as well. In fact, it's a pretty unique concept. Uh, we're going to start off with Darren. Uh, Darren, you want to bring your stuff up here? They, they, we usually give them five minutes to present and then five minutes to get Q&A from the audience. But uh, because Darren's the only one here right now, we're going to just let him go with it. Right. All right, so hello everybody, my name is Darian Stevens and I'm the CEO and founder of Hoosite and I want to talk to you for a little bit about how our platform is helping teachers and students in high school and college work on group projects online in real time. So if any of you have ever been a part of a group project, then you probably know that most people who don't contribute the same amount of work inside of a group project, you always end up with one person doing more work than other people, some people doing less work, but they all end up getting the same grade at the end. So for teachers, that causes a huge problem because they don't have a way of seeing who's contributing what to the project. So it makes grading take really, a really long time and students are still getting the same grades at the end of the day. Um, and so we created an online platform that allows students to assign themselves to tasks and uh, keep track of accountability in real time. So can I talk about our workflow, how that happens? So as a teacher, we allow teachers to create projects uh, really easily. And then each project, they, they're able to create tasks. Um, each task has its own name, description, due date, and then they can attach any file for individual tasks. Next, they put students into groups, so then they can uh, put students into 
groups with multiple students or individual groups of one if they want to just move all their work to an online platform. And then lastly, the students actually start submitting and assigning themselves tasks. And then teachers are able to go in and actually leave feedback um, in real time. So either approving or rejecting the task for the students to see, and then also um, leaving their reason as well for the students to see. So streamlining the grading process, making it paperless as well. So our market is charter schools right now, uh, charter high schools. Um, in the future, we see ourselves dealing with uh, colleges as well, public high schools. But right now, charters are the best and easiest to kind of work with and been the most open to adoption. Um, this is our competitive advantage, a quick look. Um, so the other tools that schools use, um, Google Docs is not up here, but it's another big one that um, a lot of schools and teachers use. But again, a lot of them don't focus on the accountability side or allowing students to actually submit work through the platform. So we're going to take advantage of that. Uh, this is our traction slide. We've been pretty busy um, since 2015. We launched our MVP um, at the beginning of this school year in September. So we're now in pilot with three schools here in Michigan, uh, Detroit Central High School on the west side, uh, Cornerstone Health and Technology, and Dearborn Heights on Apples, which is a public school in Dearborn Heights, down river. And this is our team. So our developers are from Alpha Django, based in Ann Arbor. Um, they worked on some pretty great stuff. Um, they had, in 2014, uh, an app they developed called Car Code be acquired by Edmonds, so we had really experienced uh, that team there. Um, I'm Darian Stevens, um, CEO, uh, passionate entrepreneur, and Adam Vuyavi is our head of operations. Can't be here tonight, but he has a lot of experience with B2B sales with school um, and hardware technology. So we're looking to get feedback. Um, love to have meetings with students or educators who'd like to take a look at the platform, see a demo, and um, yeah, I'd love to talk to you guys, so looking forward to your feedback. Yeah. Something um, that they offer that totally different from you guys? Um, no, people have actually told me not to compete with Blackboard because it's just kind of the historical um, tool that's been there forever. So certain things that apply to us don't apply to them as far as rules and things like that. I had a question. So I saw the assignment where you can give each person a task. Yeah. Can any of the tasks get multiple people on them? No. So okay. each task um, is self-assigned by the students. And they have only one person to be assigned to each task, so that keeps everything accountable. So the teacher always knows which task is responsible to which person. Okay. And then for the review submission part, mm -hmm. when they do actual grading, yeah. is there any way like that they're assigning grades or percentages of grades by questions or anything like that? that so kind of in, uh, when the teacher creates the project um, here in the description, they would probably put how they're going to grade it, but there isn't actually like a feature inside the system to where it'll go into their grade book or anything. And a lot of those other ones like um, Canvas and things like that generally don't have those either. Uh -huh. um, so the teacher still has to manually put the grade into their grade book, but um, the actual assessment and feedback happens through our platform. Yes. When they're doing the assessment, what are they assessing? Something they attach as a document, or um, it's like a built-in? Yeah, it's whatever the teacher wants it to be. So it could be um, something the teacher wants the kids to write, um, something that they want they want them to submit. If it's like, um, say, a, a pitch deck or like a PowerPoint, they want it to be attached. It all just depends on how the teacher creates the project. Right. Oh, okay. Um, you talked about three pilot schools. You yeah. like pick one of them that's been working out pretty well and what the learnings have been through that process. Yeah, so but Central High School was interesting because um, so they had one teacher to like 42 students. So that was already a big issue prior to using our platform because the teacher was doing everything manually. So using the platform like sped a lot of things up for them. Um, but then there was also the aspect of like not every student had the same um, like tech savviness. So that part had to kind of be overcome a little bit, but as the kids started getting used to doing their work that way, it became a much faster process for the kids and for the teachers. And they preferred it because a lot of them weren't carrying their like, stuff anyway to class, like papers and stuff like that. So this helped because they don't have to do that anymore. So they like that. But again, it's only been going on since September, so we're still ongoing. We're gonna see like in the future how, how it goes there. I like to think about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great idea too. You mentioned those pilots in that data that okay. in your a pitch next time because yeah. seeing those numbers in that data will help you sell it to other okay. 
as well as the school's actions. Uh, but my uh, question is, what if someone, part of the group, doesn't put in their effort? Like, they're assigned task B, but they don't do task B. Yeah. What happens is it's a group project, and they're all going to get hindered for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. Um, so there's actually uh, a part of the teacher dashboard that I don't have in the pitch deck, so this is what I kind of show in the demo. But there's a summary that shows a breakdown of like what was submitted, what wasn't, what was rejected, approved. So if the student didn't do that, the teacher would be able to see, okay, this student didn't turn this in, and then can kind of like either have a conversation with that student or just like grade them accordingly. So they'd be able to see that that student wasn't engaged or didn't assign that task or didn't submit that task, and then that student could just be addressed individually. So are you mainly being, as a student, would you be graded just on your specific tasks and, and that's it, and not the overall project? It really depends on the teacher. If a teacher wants to grade you based on your individual participation, they can do that. If they want to give you an individual grade or as a group grade, they can do that. So it really depends on how the teacher uses the platform. In this chart right here where you're comparing them as competitors, mm -hmm. um, any thoughts or have you guys looked at or is your platform available to actually see which ones you can connect to because I know a lot of schools already like or they already have blackboard and they have power yeah. school so to be able to connect that mm -hmm. would be a perfect like add-in. It would. That's something that probably like a version 2.0 we're looking to do. Um, right now I just don't have the connections to like power school and campus to be able to do like an API connection but that's definitely something that is like going to be critical going forward. Why did you start this? What was the inception? So, um, and there's, there's a few answers to that. So one, I used to be that person like doing new projects and then I was getting the same grade as everyone else even though I was like, I felt like I was doing more stuff. Um, and then also, like before I really got into this, I was in college, I was playing football and uh, I quit and I stopped playing ball. So um, I did like a surgery thing. So that kind of also sent me down the, the entrepreneurial road. So I've been working on this ever since I stopped doing that. Yeah, I don't know if you're blend space or tasks. I know a lot of people are using uh, a Pinterest type of uh, layout where you can actually put to format YouTube uh, links. Yeah. Is your uh, is your application will, will allow different type of format that will be shared with students? Right now, um, you can yeah. attach a document, so it can be a video, it can be a link to a video on YouTube or something like that. Not necessarily able to post it directly into the project, but a link or any type of file that you have on your computer can be uploaded to individual tasks or the project. So, other than attaching files, we don't have that capability right now, but yeah, in the future, that would be possible. So, what's your ask for tonight? Uh, really, feedback. This is this is great. I would love to show anyone who's been through kind of group project experiences um, a demo, things like that. If there's any educators who'd be interested in actually taking a look at the demo, I think it kind of tells a little bit more than the pitch would. Um, but again, just feedback and uh, in, in insight. Yeah. Uh, who's responsible for divide the whole project into pieces? The teacher or the group of students? It's the teacher. The teacher? The teacher creates the project, the tasks, and students just log in and assign themselves. But usually you've got a very big pro project and then you decide what to do and how to divide it into different pieces. Mm -hmm. The teacher may have no idea how you're going to implement that. For example, you're going to build a website who's going to do the front end, who's going to do the back end, and then which stacks are you using? The teacher don't have this. Usually the group of students decide who is responsible for which part. Oh, okay, so you're saying that basically, in your experience, it, the students are regular the project. Yes, so if the teacher has already known what they are going to do, mm -hmm. they don't need this, he or she would distribute this task by email to every student. Okay. Is it at the college level? Okay, okay. gotcha. Uh, would you say, like, from a, I teach young kids and I'm yeah. a professor for college students, mm -hmm. um, to have the grades in there and to automatically calculate it would be like the, the biggest thing I would be looking for. Okay. At 100%, I would want to calculate it. So that would be one thing that any way that you can add that kind of intel in there would yeah. be would be the number one thing I'd be looking Got for. It. Um, do you think you run into any issues for like group presentations? Like, is there any way to upload parts of a PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Okay. With the file attachments, it could be a PowerPoint, it could be a video of an actual presentation. So yeah. Okay. And then the thing I was thinking about for that is 
feeling like the students could make their PowerPoint all together, but then they can submit their separate parts also. Because if they submit all their different parts separately, then it wouldn't be one big PowerPoint that they could present. Yeah, so if a teacher broke each uh, like part of the PowerPoint down into tasks, then students could you know take their PowerPoint and upload it as a task or to their task and submit that. If that was something the teacher wanted to do. Yeah. 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 So is the teacher just saying there's X number of tasks and then the students just pick which ones they're gonna do or are they assigned after they start doing them? Like, I mean, we're trying to figure out who's doing the division of labor. Like, um, who decides how many tasks and who decides who's doing which? Well, I don't know if we have time to do a demo. Like, if, if uh, other presenters aren't here, I could kind of answer some of the questions by showing a walkthrough. Yes. All right. So if I come into projects within my class, I have a project here with my due date. I can click that. So here you see like this is where I can put all my grading criteria or whatever I expect from the students here. Um, set my due date down to the time and then again like file attachments. So next I want to go to groups. And I see like however many students I have in this class here. I create a new group and I get a, a bubble for a new group and then I drag and drop my students in. So whoever I want to be in this group, it's easy drag and drop. And so as a teacher, now I'm done. I already have my tasks created for this project and everything. So I'm gonna log out as a teacher, log in as a student and show you how that process goes. So as a student, I log in, I see all my classes click here I see the project and so here's all the tasks now so as a student I can I can go into each one of these tasks and I can read like what the requirements are and I can see the due dates as well and when I decide which one I want to do um, I have this assign to me button right here and so when I click that it'll assign my name to it so the teacher can now see this that I've assigned myself to that and then um, I actually log out and log in as a different student. So again, I'm, I'm a different student now in this group. Um, and if I want to assign myself this task, it'll assign to me. So again, I can see what my, what my group mates are assigning themselves to, when they've assigned it to themselves. And then the last important thing is if I'm not assigned to something, so this bottom task here, which nobody's assigned to right now, I'll go in and I'll try to submit that. And I'll get this error message here. So I'm not able to submit something that I'm not assigned to. So this is our way of like making sure that you have to be assigned to the task before you submit it. Um, keeps everybody accountable. And then if I am assigned to something like I am this task, then I can come in and I can submit that because I'm assigned to it. So at this point, this is now ready for the teacher to give me feedback and I'm just waiting on my teacher's reply at this point. And this also shows exactly what date and time I submitted it to. So my group mates will always see, okay, did I do this on time? The teacher can see, okay, did, did you do this on time? Did you do it at all? Um, yeah. Can the teacher pre-assign to the student what they want? Like, so they don't have to figure or fight thing? It takes a life to say, I don't want to do that part. Right, right. no, not, not in this version, no, it's not possible. I've, I've heard some feedback like that before, so yeah, it's good to hear that because that's a, that's a thought that some people have asked a lot. Yes? Um, is there any way to give like other group, other students um, input on how like, like kind of grade the other students on their uh, um, group activity of what they did, you know? Like, like a survey at the end, kind of evaluation? Like the kind of, kind of where they, um, where, uh, did they compromise and they all do all this stuff? Since, one of the points of group projects is to learn from skills, you know? Right. right, so you mean like an evaluation type deal? Okay, um, so no, not in this version. Again, that's something that definitely I'm um, thinking about being able to have students kind of um, 
whether it just through like star ratings or some type of easy feedback to how other people were in the project. And then we can track that like over time and like, okay, this person has historically been this type of, you know, group mate in projects. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but uh, like where do you get your funding? How did you get your funding? And like what was the cost to develop something? Like yeah, that? so um, this this was done um, by Alpha Django. So I actually know the owner there, so we had kind of like an understanding. Um, the MVP cost a little over 20K. Um, and again, uh, when I was playing football, I had a scholarship during that time. So the money that I initially had from my family to kind of Go to college when I stopped. Uh, kind of took that and used it to build my MVP. Yeah. So you're bootstrapping. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. No outside funding. Now, are you looking for outside funding? Or? Um, not at the moment, but eventually, yes. Yeah. Did you pitch this at any uh, uh, competition, like a salary commission? Um, no, I have not. I have not actually been in to those competitions. Um, but but are looking to actively looking to apply into being in those competitions. Um, so is the, the school the buyer or the individual teacher? Yeah. yeah. How does that work? So the school is definitely the, the buyer. Um, we're looking at a pay per class model right now. Um, because every every class doesn't do group projects, so it's not necessary for a school to purchase the platform for the their entire school. So um, early on we're testing a model where we purchase by class. Um, so the school is the buyer here. Yeah. Follow up to that. So, how are you going about testing the willingness of the school itself to pay for class? Like, how do you get to that? So, really, that's been a process of um, talking through the idea itself and then presenting it and trying to follow up with a demo. So, like, as the school was here, the initial platform, like, problem solution, then they like, okay, um, do you think this is a solution? Once we show them the, the platform, then they're like, okay, yes. And we're like, all right, well, how do you feel about letting us do a demo here or a pilot? And then if they agree to that, that shows like heavy buying interest. So then it's like proven to that teacher, which is the phase we're in now, like to that school through that teacher and that teacher's kids, and then the platform works with the kids, like things like that. So it's kind of like a long sales cycle, but that's the process, though. It's kind of like gauging the buying interest based on how far they kind of go. So it's like a license they buy? Or? Yeah, it'll be a license. A license for however many classes or teachers for the year. Mm -hmm. So that's per year. Yep. Yes. Um, from a suggestion standpoint, I, mm -hmm. um, you didn't have um, Google Docs on there. Mm -hmm. um, might be a good idea, or some way that, like, since they do have open APIs, mm -hmm. and I think. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think when it's a science-like project where there's like different sections and questions, yeah. you can split it up like this, but when it's more collaborative like a paper or a deck or something like that, um, it's more like paragraph by paragraph kind of thing and it might be more difficult to slice it. So thinking maybe like using Google Docs where it tells you who edited and like somehow being able to pull that API and be able to say like okay. this person edited 20% or something oh, like okay. that. So like basically still be able to let students work inside of Google Docs but still kind of track as well. Yeah, but Got tracking it. it using that might be a, that's a really good, interesting. a good, I don't know, just a good way for more collaborative. Yeah, that's really interesting because everybody has Google, yeah. like Google accounts. That's great. Anything else? No? All right, thank you guys. All right, so next uh, presenter we're going to have is um, uh, Brave Crow, uh, Francois.
All right, uh, thanks everybody uh, for inviting me. Thank you, Tan. Um, I'm sorry I'm a little late today. I'm married to my babysitter. <laughs> a little emergency. I can't say anything if anything goes wrong. Uh, this is Brand Crowder. Uh, so what we like to say is we're building opportunity rungs on the happiness ladder, right? And so, so America's advantage has always been capital formation. And something in the last generation uh, went wrong. We're at this point, last count, a million businesses that didn't get formed in the last 10 years. So we're trying to fix that. And what this platform does is it creates a financing vehicle for alternative assets. Think new businesses, think established businesses, but in particular, we're targeting franchise businesses. So uh, we started off in the Title III crowdfunding space and then very quickly pivoted to Title II and uh, opportunities farther up the distribution chain. We are a graduate of uh, QC FinTech, Bank of America's uh, FinTech Accelerator in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, our notable investors also include Blue Startups, went through their accelerator program in Honolulu. Uh, that's Tetris' accelerator program, and Hank Rogers uh, invested. We got follow-on funding from both programs. Uh, this year, we presented at Finnovate, uh, at both Silicon Valley and New York, one of the few uh, startups to present in the FinTech closed-door conference, uh, and both of them. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to start with the team. I know they say don't necessarily start with the team, but in order to pull off a big idea like that, you have to kind of establish who the team is and what they're going to do. So, John is a multi unit, multi generational franchisee. He's touched every brand uh, McDonald's, Burger King, uh, Pizza Hut, all the young brands. At one point, he was building 50 units a year. Uh, his family's done this for 40 years. Uh, EJ uh, is. Uh, an entrepreneur, and he exited from Capital Banker, a company he founded, and he's doing this now. And uh, myself, uh, I'm, my background is in compliance and regulatory. Uh, we were in franchising at a franchise development company, that's how we came together. Bob, who's our CEO, was at the board of that company. Uh, Bob's background is Wall Street, so uh, he was the treasurer at uh, ADS, Alliance Data Systems, one of the top five most successful IPOs of all time. Uh, so what is Brand Crowder? Brand Crowder is a, an alternative investment platform to invest in the free cash flows of franchise businesses. Basically allows you to invest in franchises. These are the top 50 franchises that are capitalizing right now, right? So not the 50 most established, the 50 fastest growing right now. This is McDonald's capitalization pipeline that they've curated over the last 40 years. So this sector uh, capitalizes, this is about 90% of the market, it capitalizes north of $700 billion a year. That's $493 billion in the sector in services alone. It's a 12 trillion plus cap market at this point. So the market's characterized by high transaction costs, very low turnover, but high transaction costs, very little succession planning and very little liquidity in transacting in those assets. Uh, they're basically sold today to insiders, word of mouth, to the franchise association. Specialty brokers are basically the same thing, that's still a closed group uh, of insiders. And otherwise, they're dumped onto Craigslist. I mean, you can go right now on Craigslist and go to the business section or the equivalent. Say the curb alert, buy a, buy a subway franchise. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. Um, the, there's another section of the industry, which is uh, financial advisors who are uh, advising people to take their IRAs and invest in the local lemonade stand. Uh, they call it a ROBS, rollover business startup. If someone says they're going to ROBS your IRA, believe it. That's just completely insane. Uh, the other alternative is banks and the SBA loans. Again, but that only services a very small portion of this market. So as far as we can tell from our research, about a million people, 83,000 a month, go online inquiring about franchising, inquiring about wanting to invest in franchising, and for 81,900 people a month, that pretty much ends there, right? What they do is they end up in this big rabbit hole, a bunch of franchise consultants and middlemen call them. It happened to me when I first got this idea. Um, I'm talking to a franchise consultant, trying to tell them my idea about what I want to do, and it was a complete dead end, so I decided to disrupt their industry. Uh, so how we do it, we're going to acquire these assets of scale, we're going to manage them and stabilize them as much as possible, keep existing management, 
So we control the asset, right? We're going to do, use that. We're going to go to the usual suspects, which is the Wall Street banks, to do that. So we've already been talking to Sock Gen, RBC. We thought they'd come in about 10 or 20 million in commitments uh, to, to lead a fund. And our first discussions were north of 60, 70 million per bank. Uh, once we acquire the assets, we create a platform and chop up the assets into financial product and sell them down through the private wealth distribution channel. So, um, Funderville is a local company that we have front end, right? We completely rework, reworked their platform. Finesse is our back end, it's a broker dealer kind of CRM panel. Uh, we API to FranData. So, FranData is the leading analog survey, industry wide, live, real time data survey. Uh, we approached them and said, Well, can we get your APIs? And they said, Well, no one's ever asked us before. So, we go to them. Uh, DNB, their their Michigan guys, so their uh, Michigan, their business development team is all University of Michigan guys. We're Michigan guys. They're like, here you go, here's the API, come and party. So uh, we're creating tools and we're creating uh, partners. So this is a franchise leasing company, Cathedral uh, Trust Stamp is a verification company and uses some blockchain applications, right? And so that's what supports the platform. And then we're distributing to this channel. Uh, this channel is that's Fund America crowdfunding. That's uh, investmentbank.com. They're Reg A, Millennium Trust Company. This is an example of a self-directed IRA, Wealthforge. Sort of think of that as a Title II private placement platform. So you just you sign service agreements with these people, and they distribute your product. This uh, channel that Bank of America curated for us has created that we know of at least three unicorns: Lending Tree, Lending Club, Prosper. Right. Uh, so no point in reinventing the wheel. So we think the, uh, there's some of the metrics on the market opportunity, but we think the immediately addressable market is 24 to 48 billion dollars. So again, we're cre this is a landing page. So we're creating tools, jobs, social network integration, uh, this Zillow type tool where you can just type in a zip code and get relevant geolocal and pricing information on franchises. So we're trying to onboard the whole industry and create a moat around it. Uh, we're also curating. So you can come onto our site, we're, we're, we'll post deals. We go through those deals and we filter down to the top 2%. That top 2%, we're then curating a green invest now button for them, back ends to our broker dealer. Uh, so here's an example of the strategies you can pull off on the site. So Wendy's multi-unit, large-scale multi-unit developer, say a guy's got 40, 50 units, he's got some kind of succession event, his wife's leaving him, his kid's going to college, his partner's retiring, he needs liquidity, so we provide a debt instrument for him, and then we shop it, and, and he gets funded. Uh, High Five is a new, fast, casual, made-to-order pizza in five minutes, they've got to grow very quickly, someone, the franchisee's got a lot of territory, needs to put units in the ground, we do an equity or a convertible note product for that guy so he can scale very quickly. So the debt's not going to work for him because that's taking cash flow off from his development and increasing his development risk. Uh, MedMen, they're actually a local company. They, they do the Internet of Things. They're an automated pharmacy, right? So that, the whole Internet of Things is going to be franchised. And that would be an equity fund, I believe, for that. Right? So Dollar Store, we could do, or we've been looking at doing a roll up or a consolidation play, all those plays, leverage buyouts that you learn at, in B school. Um, they'd be ready for that. So you just hit the invest button and you'd be on your way. Uh, we also do syndicates, so unlike the angel list, um, our syndicates have no pre-qualification. If you've got a good idea, we'll go through it and we'll, we'll, we'll support you, create all the syndicate paperwork and post the deal on the site. Uh, we're, we are talking to uh, some, some VCs who specialize in impact investing for a global franchise development fund. So we do have some traction. Uh, we are seven, just seven months into this. We got done the roadshow uh, after the accelerators last month. Uh, we've got about $400 million in deal flow identified. Uh, of that $400 million, we've been able to take about $65 million of it and place it with our broker dealer. And we've launched our, at this, thing, at this point, I think, first two deals uh, that you can actually invest into the platform. Uh, and been able to run some numbers on conversion rates. So the point of franchising, right, is, is beat the street, right? As any asset class, whether it's securities, energy, 
VC, hedge fund, PE, M&A, whatever you are, whatever you talk about, franchising over time consistently performs every asset class by at least 10%. All right, so there's never been anything like it. Um, so our competition uh, over here, Crowd Franchise, Honda Franchise, Springster, they had the right idea. Uh, they got a big jump on us and then never launched, right? Uh, mostly because if you focus on one unit, hey, I want to get a bunch of other friends to crowdfund my burgers, my lemonade stand, or whatever it is, right? The transaction costs are too high, right? So you have to know what you're doing in franchise. So they did launch uh, Apple Pie Capital, the banks, and SBA. Uh, their strategy is dead, right? So again, Apple Pie Capital has been very small deals. One, two, three units at most. They're distributing to banks. Their transaction, transactions costs are high, almost prohibitively so, right? And so they're not going to be able to scale. Or well, they don't have the strategy to scale. The equity crowdfunding folks, those sort of umbrella uh, companies, they've got the right strategy, but not the right focus. So they're not going to be much of a competition for us. And the institutional players who are in the space, so Fidelity and Schwab, uh, four, four or five years ago, went heavily into this space in terms of putting on an alternative asset platform or clearinghouse. Um, and they've since remediated. Now, my brother works for Schwab, so we can have that discussion off camera. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think one of the major impediments to those kinds of institutional players playing is that the independent brokers don't want to onboard their investors at their competition's site to invest in deals no matter how good they are, right? So they've remediated to ETFs and mutual funds. ETFs and mutual funds are too high in terms of cost and too low in terms of yield to compete with us. So uh, Brian Carter's there on the right, uh, traction, scalability, strategy, and distribution. How we make money, uh, when we take a carried interest, every fund we create, Right? We take 20%, right? we get 2% of funds under management. We also do some transaction fees both on both sides of the market. So the people who are coming to us to create the product and the people who are selling the product, uh, we're selling the product to both pay transaction fees. Uh, so uh, this is a much longer discussion than this slide's gonna allow, but uh, there's sort of a rule of thumb and depending on the size of your team, most players in this space aren't gonna give you uh, enough capital to scale this well beyond so for half a billion or a billion dollars, right? So the only strategy we know of to scale without, without hiring 300 people is basically automating all this on blockchain or, uh, excuse me, asymmetrical distributed ledger, right? So the, the, the strategy there is to scale quickly and, and show the banks that we can scale. So part of our platform is to create that automated investment bank 2.0. We're also inaugural members of the AMDAC, the automated digital alternative asset quotation system, and they're growing by leaps and bounds, so that'll be an opportunity for us to scale as well. Uh, that is Rand Crowder. Again, I apologize for uh, being late today, and if you have any questions. What's the minimum I can invest uh, to be able to partake, partake in it? And how do I notice my returns? And how do I actually, if I want to cash out, so to speak, how do I get up and, and leave? So uh, we're not in the Title Three crowdfunding space, right? So it gets kind of prohibitive for us. Our, our transaction spend is so significant per deal. So it gets prohibitive for us to really let people on below $10,000. Mm -hmm. But for anybody, for every person who comes in with 100000 we could let someone in with $1,000. So, and, and depending on the deal structure, right, so an equity deal structure is going to be a lot of two to five years, right? Uh, straight debt deal structure is going to cash flow immediately, right? Um, and we structure those depending on, on the life cycle of the brand and where they are with the deal. Right? So, we'll say an established Wendy's would be cash flowing immediately, whereas the mac and cheese deals we've got down the street, um, they'll cover franchise times last month or in July. And, uh, that's that is an equity deal that lots of us five years, but you're going to get an in five years. And does the, uh, the person that invests, do they have any say in how this is run? Is there any meetings that they get to No, no. Like that? No. So, so we stand, we're the, so the development risk of the future is the unseen risk, right? the actual operational risk. We've been running franchises for four years, 
part of our management team, right? Yeah. You know, we stand between uh, the investor, the brand, and everybody and make sure that it actually operates correctly. Right. Whereas our competition, and that was part of the problem with Schwab, they don't, they don't know what's going in, they're not keeping an eye on what, how it's performing. We're API into them, DMV, and uh, brand data. If there's a problem, we're going to get a red flag immediately in terms of the brand, how the brand's performing, in terms of the region, how the region's performing, uh, all kinds of different indicators we can get immediate red flags. Now, is this your own development team developing this platform, or are you contracting it out? Or? So, uh, we've been focused on the actual sort of analog more than anything else in terms of development, and we've been talking to uh, the problem is trying to piece it all together and find a player who can who can do everything yeah. end to end, sort of the interface to the, the back end to the blockchain and all integrated, right? So we've been talking about Cognizant, right? And and they're thinking about investing in terms of and they bring the tech, right? So we we've been wireframing and then doing this a lot analog, right? Waiting on finding the right tech partner. Do you have to be a franchise? Could it be like a, a, a non franchise, but like distributing your wide and you're scaling it? So we'll do any branded deal, that's our sweet spot. So any branded business strategy, we'll do. Right? So it does not have to be a franchise. Um, from the earliest, if you've got an idea, we'll add our two cents, and if it works, we'll launch it. We'll launch a syndicate. Right? Um, or say like a Coca Cola distribution. So it's a major opportunity right now in a lot of corporate uh, refranchising or corporate um, off of booking, right? So remediation of large corporation balance sheets because they haven't been proposing to their bankers and the SEC what their long-term goals are. I'm sorry. What's the failure rate for franchising? And do you feel like making the process easier will make it the failure rate go up or your close monitoring will keep it in check? So the, the failure rate for an established franchise is established player, the top tier, as you saw there, is less than 2%, right? Um, and I think that when we're doing, talking about doing it at scale, um, and, and with such a low failure rate, that 2% that, that, that sort of uh, transition is just, it's just, it's just moving chips in the table, right? So certainly, if, if we're doing a deal at scale, we know what we're doing. Uh, sometimes it's more tricky with, with the uh, smaller, newer brands, right? right? Uh, but the returns reflect that as well, right? So you may come in a small brand, three, five EBITDA, and sell out at 12, 15 EBITDA, right? Easy type return. Yeah, there's a good return. Reward would reflect that. Okay. Sure. How do you mitigate the risk for the investor? Like, I'm at you at $50,000. How do I, like, it's an easy investing process, but what happens if that franchise does go under? What what happens on the, on the investor end? I mean, the investor absorbs the risk, right? right? What, what we're bringing to the table is a curated deal and, and control. So it's, it's automated. The API is actual data. There's not there's no one out here as a franchise developer who's API in real data in real time and, and trying to look as the ball as far down the road as possible. We're using established developers as we're industry insiders. We know, we know who all the guys are who can develop and franchise at scale, right? And then we just make to a right developer. So we're taking a lot of those risks off the table, right? So, um, but, but you know, franchises fail. You know, businesses fail. It just does happen. I think that if uh, you're in a diversified franchise fund and you're experiencing losses, which I don't think has ever happened in the last 30 years. Uh, this is something we're in a lot more trouble <laughs> than just worrying about your $50,000. There's a lot more going on for that. But, but let me say that uh, if you're in securities in, the Wall, in Wall Street, right, if you're buying stocks, uh, you're not investing in a direct cash flow for business. The business could be really great, but that doesn't mean your stock price is going up. And you're subject to black swan events, which are happening every four years like financial crisis, Brexit exits. And all of a sudden, people lose 30 percent of the portfolio, even though the company is doing great. Right. So for us, if the cash register is ringing, you're making money. More questions? All right. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, so three months.
much for what we're going to do is that I know we're we supposed to have four presenters going down to two. Does anyone have any uh, ideas or uh, startup ideas or businesses that are in the work works or already moving? You want to, this is an opportunity. We're just going to keep making an open table um, so that way we could, you know, you can get input from the from the crowd. Uh, that's one way of doing it. I think the other is that you know we can all just go ahead. Um, do a more like a, a circle discussion, discussion, uh, and um, and kind of move around we'll and just, or go to the bar early. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but I can go ahead. This is what this is a, this is what it's all about, me. So it's all right. All right, great. So I just quickly explain what I do and what our service does, and then I'd love to take feedback after afterwards. Any questions, concerns, or anything like the next steps that you see um, that might be an issue or whatnot. So my name is Phil Acola. I'm the founder of Alocito. So Alocito is an on-demand dining service that removes all wait times in restaurants. So what it typically is, it's an online food ordering and re reservation service that allows customers to pre-order and prepay for their dining meal. So let's say you're at work, it's 11 o'clock in the afternoon, and you want to get out of the office for lunch, you got maybe 45 minute lunch for like one hour. So you go on the mobile app, and you actually pre-order your meal at the restaurant for that specific time, so let's say 12 o'clock. So it's 11.45, comes around, you go head towards the, the restaurant. As soon as you get there, the host actually knows you by name and face, greets you and walks you to your table. Within five minutes, your food's actually done, prepared, ready for you to enjoy at the table. And take your time, enjoy your meal, but whenever you're ready, you can just get up and leave since payment's ready to take care of an events. So for the customer, it, what this does is it allows customers, employees to get out of the office for lunch. It streamlines the whole Russian experience. So you have a more of a VIP experience. You get there, everything's taken care of for you. Um, for the restaurants themselves, it increases table turnover. Uh, as well as brings in those new, uh, new customer base that they didn't have before, these employees that was, weren't able to get out of the office for lunch. And then for companies themselves, it helps get their employees out of the office within a 30 minute period or 45 minute, or whatever lunch break that is. So now their employees aren't getting, getting uh, be coming late to the office to come back to the office. As well as there's a lot of data out there that shows that employees are more creative and productive once they get out of the office for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so that's what Alexio is. Um, we've been in the works for a while now, but we officially launched three weeks ago here in downtown Detroit. We're running our pilot program at Cornerstone Detroit, and we're in conversations with a lot of other restaurants in the area. So uh, that's what we do. Feel free to download the app. Right now it's only on the, the App Store with Apple, but in the near future we'll plan to expand to the, the, the Android market. How do you handle tips like Uber and Lyft? We'll do it later. Yeah, exactly. So the, the way we handle tips is eventually within the first version of our app, it's it's preset at an eighteen percent tip. So ultimately, the servers um, that's how it works within the app itself. So it's eighteen percent tip for the service for the for the convenience of of uh, going through the service like that. How does capacity work? Like, how do I know while I'm at work? Like, how a crowded that restaurant is? Good question. Great question. So, so it's an online food order and a reservation service. So on the, the restaurant side, so on, on the user side, it's an app. But on the restaurant side, they have a web-based portal and platform. Okay. So within that platform, they allocate X amount of tables for the service. Gotcha. So if you were a customer looking to eat, if that table is not available, it will not show up on the app. So when once you choose your meal item for that time. Uh, yeah. That time is available for you and you, you have it. So I reserve like ahead, like hours ahead of time, and they'll already know what the reservations look like around that time when I get there. Either hours ahead of time, day ahead is, is okay. the, the most you can do it, or an, an hour before. Okay. Before. That's awesome. You thought this through, That's pretty cool. It yeah. seems like you got something going on. How you? Uh, how's the uh, model? What's the pricing model? What? what how are you making? I guess uh, your your business. Definitely. The way what we're doing it right now, it's a, it's a dollar transaction fee per order on the restaurant side, as well as a dollar convenience fee for the consumer right now. So every order we receive a two dollar transaction order fee. Follow up to that. So does the restaurant like that? I mean, the restaurant's paying money. They don't. Do they want to do that? <laughs> definitely, definitely. So what we do is it's a lot cheaper than most. Of, I mean, what we do is different than most online food ordering services do. Um, majority of, on the board, like a grub hub on average charges about 13% for 
fee. So what we do is actually it's a great pay per order. Um, so a dollar order for most orders is, is a lot less than that thirteen percent. It could be like about five percent or even less than that is off the order. So it doesn't matter if it's a thirty dollar order or a hundred dollar order. It's a flat dollar fee, and they only pay for the service when you pay for the orders. Um, I assume is it like a finalized transaction? Like if you try to set up a launch or whatever, and then you can't make it, is it just kind of? I guess. How do you go about that? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, so with that involved, within the order, it, the, ed, the order and the customer side is able to edit the order or cancel the order up until the time the meal is starting to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Once it's sent to the kitchen, then it finalizes the order and you can't edit or cancel the order. You can still reach out to the restaurant if you need something specific, like, oh, uh, whatever that, that need is, so you can say, oh, my, five minutes, five minutes late or whatnot, but you can go from there. But yeah, you can cancel or edit the order up until it's time it's prepared. How many restaurants are using your app, and what's your biggest competitor? Okay, uh, right now we started the pilot of Corners on Detroit, so right now just one restaurant. Uh, it's been about two and a half weeks since we launched. Things have been going great. The average table turnover right now is 27 minutes. So I mean, the average table turnover majority of restaurants, depending on the restaurant, it's usually between 60 to 75 minutes. So when someone gets out of the office, like, it's like hardly it's hard for them to get back to the around time. So yeah, 27 minutes is our turnover uh, with Cornerstone Detroit right now. But we're looking to speak with a lot of the restaurants in the area. Uh, we do have one direct competitor. We have a lot of indirect competitors. There's a lot of people in that space. But we have one direct competitor right now. They're based out of San Francisco. Um, they're called Offset, and they were actually based originally a Ukraine based business called Settle Order, and then they rebranded and moved to San Francisco. Um, they just recently did another round with uh, Andres and Horowitz. Um, so they're doing great things. Uh, but we are in the same space, but we do it a little differently. Mine is a reservation service as well. What they do is when you place your order, they have to accept the order of the table to uh, Are you having to work individually with every restaurant that you do you have to build partnerships with the restaurants? And then how does that work with scalability? Like if you're gonna to try to get to import every single restaurant's menu, and are you gonna to have, to have partnerships with every single restaurant? How do you approach scalability going forward? Definitely. So the way our platform works, I mean originally right now what we do is go basically, you know, we need the manpower to go restaurant to restaurant, but ultimately with the service how it works with the web platform, the restaurant could essentially be able to go online, sign up, and within an hour they could be up on the app and ready to go. The reason why we're not doing that right now is because of the training of the restaurant. We want to make sure that the servers understand how it works and what needs to be done. That ultimately, if the restaurant doesn't execute properly, then it doesn't look good for the customer, the food's not ready or whatnot. But eventually, we plan to build uh, with a webinar or whatnot so the customers, the restaurants could be trained effectively. They know what to do from the get-go. So within an hour, they can sign up, update the menu themselves. Uh, update their account information and they can be up and running within, within an hour. Okay. Monica, did you have a question? He answered it. Okay. He, well, he said it when he said it. All right. Well, about advertising, you guys looked into the, uh, getting paid advertisements, so that way it could be a revenue generator? Definitely, definitely. That's something we're considering. Um, but you say to, an, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an alternative source of Fun. revenue for us? Yes, so later on we do plan to do with that, our marketing as well as um, Maybe have a one or two slot. Like once we have a lot of restaurants on service, we have to move up top of the list. Like uh, you can maybe pay a, 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 a yep. daily fee or monthly fee or whatnot for the first two slots, and then the rest is all based by cheap. Yes. Um, what do you expect in terms of marketing budget? Like, what do you Definitely, definitely. I mean, as a, yeah, it is a two-sided market, so there's a fine uh, line we have to play with in terms of that. But it's like you can't get restaurants without the users, and you can't get the users without the restaurants. But once you do able to say you get more users, then use, I'm going to use that as leverage to get more restaurants. So what I'm working at is actually work with local companies, um, like let's say uh, Quicken Loans, for example. Say I have this service. So like an employee work program, so I have this service that allows your employees to get out of the office for lunch and still make it back that time for work and use those employee base as leverage to get more of the restaurants in the area. Um, so do you also have a review system? So, you know, if there's something maybe on the menu that someone wants to know how it is or some 
know, eventually when you will expand to other restaurants, what restaurant people want to choose? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. Yeah, I thank I mean, thanks to you for the feedback. Yeah, so within the service itself, the customers can review specifically menu items in their order. And like with the, with the Yelp nowadays, when you were, when you do a review, it's all based off of the restaurant as a whole, and not specifically for the menu item. So right now, it's not implemented within the app itself, but on the side, we do have a prototype for a food recommendation system that allows customers. It, it actually is a machine learning that it understands your, your your food habits. So like Netflix, how they recommend you different movies, this does specifically for the food items. So a lot of times as a customer at a restaurant, when, what you actually serve for, it's usually the you know, menu item as well as, oh, what's, what's good here? Even though their taste can be totally different from your taste. So the more you, rec you know, review your menu items, what you're ordering or what you're allergic to, it will fine tune those menu items at those restaurants. So that's just a prototype, but that's something we're not focused on right now. That's something we're going to build into a later on. But thank you for that feedback. Do you have a website? Yes, um, it's alocito, A-L-O-C-I-T-O dot com. So yeah, feel free to download the app on the App Store. Um, not yet on Android, so I'm sorry about that, Android users, but we will go over there. I know, I know. Um, so I know a lot of sit-down restaurants also do carry-out. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to compete with the carry-out market or just sit down? Because like, you know, people order ahead and can call on and say, hey, I'm going to pick this up. Definitely, that's a great question. With that, not right now, this is our initiative we're focusing on, but within the next fall months, we do a kind of expand to pick up and delivery market as well. You know, that's a seventy billion dollar market. For the most part, it's still relatively untapped. I mean, there's like drop out noise, big service orders. The still, majority of the orders are what we fall. So once we do focus on this niche, we do a carry out the market as well. Who's your team is? Who's our who's part of the team? So right now, the majority of my team is outsourced. Yeah. So I'm looking in the near future to get a team here in house on here. So are you the problem? I am. Yes. So I heard you say iPhone Android is coming. What about a web app for the customer? If you already have a web app for the restaurant, I, if I want to see a menu, I think I'd rather see it on my laptop, you know, make some good decisions there, rather than trying to do it on my phone. Yeah. Definitely, you know, that's a good, good point, and that's something we're looking into as well. Thank you. All right, well, if anyone has any questions, concerns, afterwards, like I said, feel free to download the app. Average table turnover right now is about 27 minutes at this restaurant's. Uh, we're looking to expand to more restaurants, so if anyone knows any restaurant tours looking to have a competitive advantage and give their customers a VIP experience, um, feel free to let me know. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just the slides. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? I mean, my yeah. email is phil at alocito.com. Feel free to email me. A couple of things you guys, uh, in December we are doing, typically do have a, uh, a uh, pitch event and it's, uh, it's usually sponsored by you know, our, our sponsors. So we don't know where it's going to be held right now, but uh, overall usually we bring about 50 to 75 people. Last year we had about over 100 people uh, at Tech Town and then the year before that we had over 100 people over at, I uh, uh, can't remember our other location, the Detroit uh, Natural Resource, DNR. So anyways, uh, we're always trying to uh, um, bring the community out to the Detroit uh, D New Tech event and they actually win prizes. So something like that I think it's really, really down your alley. We have two events, one is the five minute pitch and then the next is the rapid fire. So pretty much you're just coming up with uh, I think a 60 second head, um, pitch. Again, it's all for fun. I mean, really no pitch is a bad pitch to be honest. I think uh, for you to have a guts to come up here to talk like that, I think that's awesome. Uh, anyone else? Any, uh, anybody wants to just come up and just share what the idea is? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm pitching to Accelerate Michigan tomorrow. I can do it. Yes. Go. It's come on, man. It's going to be longer. It's like eight minutes. Hey, we're all here now, so. Sure, sure. Come up. Yeah, I know there's a couple of you. It doesn't even have to be a tech company, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be a tech company. I mean, we know that, uh, that uh, there's a lot of startup companies out here. And like myself, I have two software companies. The third company I have is called Salary Kit. It's a, it's a non tech, but it, the whole idea is. You know, we're starting uh, a new uh, and helping to speed up the economic development that's coming on in the Detroit area. Do you want me to go ahead and do the team? Yeah.
And afterward, we actually go into the Detroit Beer uh, Company, right, uh, where on the other side of the corner, if anyone's going to join us. What's your name? Ferris. Ferris, sorry. Thanks, Ferris. Yeah. So, uh, just quick background. Accelerate Michigan is a pitch competition. Uh, it's at Cobo Hall tomorrow. Um, there's 36 companies. Uh, the grand prize is half a million dollars, and then there's second is 100K, 50K, and then there's a few 25K. Uh, it'd be nice to walk away with one of those checks, uh, but yeah, we'll go from, go from there. My name is Ferris Savetti. I'm the co-founder and CEO of MySwimPro. We're the number one fitness application for the fastest growing sport in the world. We help people in over 150 different countries achieve their personal fitness and training goals. Now, I love swimming, and I have the chlorine in my veins to prove it. And as a lifelong swimmer and coach, I've seen a lot of the challenges that swimmers face today. To start, accessing a structured training program is extremely difficult. If you want to hire a personal coach, it's expensive, anywhere from 50 to 100 an hour. On top of that, swimming on your own can be boring. It can be monotonous. And without the right training plan, and without the right guidance, achieving your goals can be a real challenge. In the United States alone, there are over 26 million people who swim for fitness. Of those, over 9 million swim more than 50 times per year. And there's a group of people, over 5 million, that are active lap swimmers that are between the ages of 25 and 64. This beachhead market represents less than one-tenth of the global market that spends over $20 billion every single year on just swimwear. We know this market to be global because on our platform, a majority of our existing user base is outside of the United States. It's a huge underserved market in a time when the health and fitness industry is booming. In just the last three years, there have been over a billion dollars in just mobile health and fitness acquisitions. Companies like Adidas and Under Armour shelling out hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire the latest and greatest in sports technology. So why hasn't anyone owned swimming yet? You have companies like Apple, Garmin, and Fitbit investing serious cash to get these wearable devices in the hands of millions of swimmers around the world. In fact, 74% of our target demographic will acquire a personal fitness tracking device in just the next 12 months. And we are positioned perfectly to become the central hub of all of these connected devices. But even without a wearable device, our mobile application delivers an incredible experience for our athletes. From the moment you launch the application, you're just three taps away from unlocking a personalized workout along with instructional video content and detailed analytics so you can track your progress and measure your improvements. Last month, we launched the world's first swimming app on the Apple Watch, and we were thrilled to see our app on display in Apple CEO Tim Cook's keynote address on September 7th, where he launched the iPhone 7 and the Apple Watch Series 2. Our Apple Watch app redefines personal coaching on a wearable device. You can sync a workout from the Apple iPhone to your watch, and it'll guide you through a workout set by set, just like a personal coach would. That is a true innovation for the sport of swimming. We have over 120,000 registered athletes who have together across our iPhone and Android devices logged over 150 million meters. That's the equivalent of swimming around planet Earth more than three times. Now, if we look at the business that supports our product, Here's the unit economics. We have 15,000 monthly active, and of those, 2.1% convert to premium on iPhone, and 0.8% convert to premium on Android. Our freemium model is pretty simple. For a monthly fee of $10, you unlock advanced workout content, instructional videos, and more detailed analytics. We launched this in April, and today we have over 320 recurring premium subscribers with a retention rate that's close to 80%. We've done a little bit of paid advertising, and we know that our cost to acquire a premium athlete is around $25.
so that we know our payback period is less than four months. Now, we acquire users for very little cost. Most have come organically through word of mouth and following us through our content. On social media, we have over 60,000 followers across the big three, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we know that with proper funding, we'll be able to accelerate this through paid channels, which we've already tested and know which ones works. We also know that we have to build community because that's what's really separated the most successful fitness applications. It has a network effect. The more people that are on our application, the stickier it becomes and the more valuable it is. So if you look at the competitive landscape, two notable players that come to mind. You have the Speedo Fit application and Swim.com. The difference between us and those guys is the personalized coaching experience that we deliver as well as the community that we've already built and will continue to build over time. Now, we've been self-financed today, and the only money in so far is the University of Michigan Startup Accelerator that we just completed their program two months ago. In fact, just this week, we got a commitment from Invest Detroit for another 50,000 towards our seed round, and they're the ones running this Accelerate Michigan competition. So with proper funding, we'll be able to grow to profitability in Q3 of 2018. Now, it's important to remember, in the eyes of the acquiring brand, like an Under Armour or an Adidas, they're much less interested in these metrics and much more interested in the scale and depth of the community, because that's what makes these businesses valuable. And that's exactly where we're focused. So let's take a look at those numbers. So this is at our current growth rate. And we know that by building community and building these wearable integrations, we'll be able to scale. With proper funding, we'll be able to grow these numbers much more quickly. And we know that the value of our business is highly associated with our user base. And so that's where we're really focused right now. Now, our founding team is comprised of two highly accomplished collegiate swimmers and two software engineers who have led mobile teams at Fortune 100 companies. We've also surrounded ourselves by a group of advisors that not only bring Olympic swimming accolades, including Peter Vanderke, who's a three-time Olympian in swimming, but we've surrounded ourselves by a group of advisors who have started, scaled, and sold mobile fitness companies to the largest sports brands in the world, including the co-founder of Runkeeper, the former VP of product at Strava, and the current VP of Connected Digital at Under Armour. Now together, we are a world-class team. And with the help of Accelerate Michigan, we'll be able to put Michigan on the map as the home of the number one fitness application for the fastest growing sport in the world and help people everywhere achieve their personal fitness goals and live happier and healthier lives. Thank you. content to keep your competitors from just like, you know, analyzing your app and putting that into the... Yeah, so the, the IP on the tech side is very limited. I mean, the content's not really protected because then you can go and write a workout or create an instructional video, right? So we created the content and we can make it. Right. The thing that makes art um, like defensible is, is really in that community and getting more people on, more people putting their data into the app. If anyone's using like a fitness application, once you've tracked like five runs in the app, you're not going to go change to another application. Like it's just a pain. Um, and then having a bigger community so that it's a place where all your friends are. Like you're not going to leave Facebook because all your friends are on Facebook. So that's really our challenge now is how do we rapidly acquire market share so that we just build a wall against anyone else that can So you're like, you rely on customer loyalty basically. Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. Yeah. What features do I get as a free user? Just yeah. Watch. So you get almost everything as a free person, you just not as much of it. Okay. So you're going to get workouts, you're still going to get videos, you're still going to be able to track your stats, mm -hmm. you're still going to get app, um, but you don't get as many workouts, you don't get as much analytics, you get a quarter of the video library. Okay. Yeah. Is there any advertising on the free that can help cover costs or is that? Uh, so we haven't done any advertising, um, and I don't think we will, uh, just because it dilutes the value overall. Um, it might be something as we scale to be uh, to have like more users. 
Um, the one thing that's similar to advertising is where you can have a brand sponsor challenge within the application. So you're not necessarily uh, displaying an advertisement natively in the app, but Under Armour could say, you know, we're going to sponsor a distance challenge for the month of October, and we're going to pay you based on how many your engagement, how many eyeballs you're basically going to give us, and they're essentially renting the audience. So that's what like Matt My Fitness, Matt My Run, um, a lot of those fitness apps have done that, and that's what they've advised us to do. Um, it's just a matter of like building that in with all the other stuff on our roadmap. Yeah. Talk about uh, cost of acquiring users, lifetime value. What's lifetime value for uh, a user? Yeah, so uh, the cost to acquire is $25, roughly. Um, it, so it's very varied. If you actually look at our cost to acquire based on uh, paid advertising within the App Store, it becomes like $10. Um, it could be as high as $50. Um, so our lifetime value is fuzzy to calculate that exactly because we've only had premium for the last five months. Um, we do know that our retention rate is close to 80%. Uh, so you just do the math off of that, you know, our lifetime value is you know five or six months, which would be $60. But at the same time, uh, premium is really MVP right now. So if we can improve what premium offers, we'll get people to continue paying us for the longevity of their existence. And that's what like the best fitness apps have done. If someone's paying premium, they're locked in, they don't even care about it anymore. They just pay it monthly. Um, we're not there yet, so that would be the goal. Yeah. Have you guys have you guys studied um, the uh, the other fitness tracking like how how all those kind of came to be and, and who came out ahead and what they did? Did you yeah. look at that one? Yeah, so the, the most successful fitness apps um, like they come to mind uh, just because they're on this slide. So, Matt My Fitness, you know, Matt My Run, Matt My Ride, for example, it was the 97, number 97 and 101 app in the App Store, period. So back when the iPhone came out. So like, they just had first mover advantage. Um, half of these had first mover advantage. Um, so that's why for us to be number one right now and to hold that together is really important because um, like as we integrate these different wearables, like the first on Apple Watch and the single garment, like that's what will make or break us, how fast we can do that. So we just sit on our hands and like, yeah, let's keep building this out and then three years later, someone else is gonna come in and buy the market. So uh, it is really interesting to look at all of these comparables and to know, well, crap, we just do something that these guys have done, things can turn out well. So, um, but it's not easy, obviously. Yeah. Um, how do you come up with the, the workouts or the mm. training regimen? Is that part of your staff? You guys have like swimming experts, or how is it? Yeah, so uh, we do that all on our, our own on our team. Um, like we luckily have the, the domain expertise within us that we can do that. We don't have to like hire a coach or something. Like I'm a nationally recognized adult fitness coach. Um, our advisors are Olympian and swimming, just like the video content, all that stuff. Just we make it. Okay, so you guys are actually in the. The video doing. Yeah, you'll see, you'll hear my voiceover actually on a lot of the stuff. So if you download that and you watch the video, it's going to be So, how is the user's performance tracked? For Run Keeper, I would mm -hmm. imagine yeah. how many miles I've been running. Mm -hmm. But for the swimming, how is my performance yeah. measured? Yeah. yeah, so it's a slightly different value prop. So, for like Run Keeper or Runtastic, it's using the GPS in your phone and then it'll know how far you went. So, for swimming, that's important if you're going to go like open water swimming. But the, the problem set's different for a swimmer. Um, so for a swimmer, what they're looking for is like, what is my actual workout before I even get to the pool? Like, how am I gonna, I wanna go swim for 60 minutes, how am I gonna spend those 60 minutes? Like, am I gonna be back to a presser? How much of it am I gonna do? How much rest am I gonna get? So that training regimen is way more important than the actual tracking. Now with tracking, you know, when you have like the Apple Watch, you can mindlessly swim and track all your stuff and say you swam 2,000 meters, you job whatever the heart rate was. Whatever. So um, the thing that made these guys grow really quick was the distribution through GPS technology enabled devices, so the smartphone. So that next wave of distribution through wearable devices is coming, and we're really banking on being the hub for all those devices to, to track all that for you. I was thinking about you use some wearable technology to track your performance. Yeah. Another question: Is there any social component that built in with this app for example? In Run Keeper, you can encourage each other for right. runners. In, yeah. In, in your app, do you have something like this? Yeah, you so can post some pictures after your swim. 
Yeah, so we're launching that like right now, this is the current product initiative. It's already live on Android, so you can follow other athletes in the app, and then they can like and comment and share on your workouts. Um, it's coming on an iPhone in about two weeks, we'll have that live. And then along with that, like goal setting, so that you can set goals, other people know you have a goal set, and then you're part of this like community that people are sharing and comparing and encouraging each other. So that's that's where we know we're going to be able to grow. We just have to build it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was like on the swim team in high school. Is yeah. there is there any like do you have any plans to like do schools or anything mm -hmm. like that for the, for the uh, swimmers? Yeah. So there's a enterprise software approach to this, so we can build like a workout management suite for a coach. Um, and you can sell that pretty easily to like a college coach or a high school coach. Um, that's like a different segment of the market that we're not playing with right now because it's harder to sell. It's actually harder to sell into like a college coach than just sell to a swimmer. Like like you know, if you want to go swim and you want to work out, like it's an easy fit versus selling to a college coach is like really hard. Um, that's the exactly what they want for us. There's no MVP for a college coach. They don't. I'm not gonna look at it unless it does everything you need. So we'll get there eventually. Well, the cool thing about it, I'm not sure if that right. Are you going to stick around here? Are you going to come out with us? I know the, the reason why I ask is because I know that you presented here uh, not, uh, about a year ago, right? Yeah, a year ago. Yeah, Yeah, and actually, I mean, it's gone a long way. I'm glad you heard that you got your VCC funding. We're working on it. Oh, okay. tomorrow we'll start our issue. Hopefully they cut us in the check. No yeah. problem. <laughs> so anyways, you stick around. Sure. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to kind of wrap up on it. Um, yep. We do have, uh, we're going to hang out at the Detroit Beauty Club tonight. Anybody has any events? Usually what we do is wrap up is kind of share with each other. Are there any events that you're aware of that you want to share with the members? I know like uh, Ferris has said that tomorrow. I think they sold out on the, um, on the um, yeah. pitch event. So I don't think there's any more seats, but I think they're event by itself. You can actually attend. I just don't know if the pitch event is available right now. Um, yeah, the one at night's closed, but you might be able to sneak in during the day. Yep. So uh, I know tomorrow here, a salary uh, mission at uh, Cobo. Uh, any other events you want to share? Besides, I know the Detroit New Tech, we meet the first ones every month. Uh, December is our last, uh, it's our last month of the year, so we tend to have a big, like I said, pitch event. So we'll kind of share that with the community as soon as we kind of wrap up where it's going to be held, and as well as what type of prizes they're going to be as well. Monica. I was just going to say, I, um, today we've sent out another, uh, the newest start of Digest Detroit, and um, that has probably two dozen events in, in Metro Detroit meetups of, of every different kind of coding flavor, pitch competitions, classes, workshops, things like that. So from a, a, a gathering standpoint, and I know several of the VC groups use it as their, um, their piped in calendar, so that would be a good one for people to find um, other information. We'll post it on the comments for this meetup. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Here at Grand Circus, Friday, December 16th, I believe at noon, uh, we're going to have our demo day. And about half the people still here are going to be presenting their student projects as they wrap up .NET front end and Java. So if you're looking for some developer skills, uh, we're going to have you know some great student ideas and some great talent on display. Check it out. So we will have the DU take on pitch comes on the 15th so they can practice and then they can pitch on the 16th. There you go. Awesome. Anyone else? Also, in our new tech, and I don't know if you've been out there, but pretty much they're, they're, they're gathering. They have about 5,000 members already, but uh, they usually have a really big event always at the law, um, the law building in downtown uh, Ann Arbor on the campus of U of M. The third Tuesday. The third Tuesday every, uh, of every month. And that is it, you guys. Thanks for coming out, and uh, we'll see you next month.